consulate in Los Angeles. And uh, he's been a great friend of Champs Media, a great friend of uh, a Daring Abroad. And I've met him in several forums that we discuss, where we discuss investment opportunities, both home and away. So he, he really has given us a great honor to be part of this event. Uh, when I called him when I was in Nairobi, he told me, Alex, my brother, I'll do everything to come to Houston. And uh, we, are, we are glad that he's the one opening our first ever meet and greet uh, opportunity. Tumpigie makofi kabla kuje. Balozi, karibu. Najua ningesema mengi, mengi, siju mefanya nini, uko Nairobi, nini, nini, but wacha tutu wachia po kwa balozi. Yo, kitaka kutoboa. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name's, uh, th my na I was actually told is my name is, it's not names, right? Those of you who are here doing English. Uh, my name's uh, Thomas Kwaka Omolo, but I'm better known as Big Ted. Um, uh, a few things have happened which I need to share with you. Number one is uh, I'm four days short, three days short of being one year in the, in the States. I came here last year, uh, three days. So for me, it's a big thing, and looking behind and seeing what has one year been like, uh, what impact have I made to people. So that's a great um, celebration for me. Uh, it was also my daughter's birthday yesterday, so I'm loving it. She's, she's out there in, in Kenya. Um, uh, also, Right now, as you speak in Los Angeles, California, at the Porsche showroom, uh, they are expecting me to walk in for me to receive an award, a diaspora award for work I'm doing in the diaspora. Uh, but I'm here. I chose to come and share my time with you guys, because this is what pays me. I was actually sent here to serve you, not to receive awards. So I'd rather be here with you. I'll, I'll collect it tomorrow, the next day. It's not a problem. But also yesterday, um, I was actually in Seattle in the morning. I just got here in the evening. Uh, I was conferred upon uh, an honorary doctorate um, degree. Now, I was, ex I was expecting you guys to clap at that point, but it's OK. Uh, it's all right. It's all right. I understand. I understand. I understand you also want something, but hey, it's not coming. And uh, allow me to, to, I serve two kingdoms. I serve uh, the government of Kenya, but I also serve the kingdom of God. So you'll have to understand as I speak. You need to know what I'm saying, all right? It might sound the same, but it might not necessarily be the same. Also, that's my dad. He raised me. He's actually my mentor, uh, Mr. Paul Akata. You guys know him as uh, pastor. All my teenage years were spent in his house being straightened out and being taught about life and loving God and everything. Um, let me jump to the chase and tell you why it's very important for me to, uh, to be here. Is I think you get to a place, I was talking to a doctor earlier on and he told me, Ted, you know what, I've been here for so long, I don't think my life here has any use. I'd rather go to Kenya and put it to work there. I think you get to a place in your life whereby it's about legacy and not necessarily about what you can get out of it. And uh, I give myself to the diaspora because I have done a lot. I look young, but I'm not very young. But I've done a lot. And right now, it's all about legacy for me. It's about me being able to be given a responsibility to come out here, to give myself, to apply myself to it, Yesterday, we were with Kenyans until 5 in the morning. You know Kenyans. We were with them till 5 in the morning. But the idea is this. It's not necessarily to be out there. It's what can we do to change the lives of people. I know you've given Kenya your best. I know Kenya, to some of you, has not been what you wanted. I know Kenya has disappointed you. I know there's been so many times that you've depended on that mechanic to come from abroad to fix that car and to walk with you in things that you think this car can be able to do. I know you, you've tired that you said, listen, I have a better car now. I don't need that car. But guys, I hope Kenya can call back to you 
and for all of us to apply ourselves back to Kenya and say, you know what, can we be able to, in small ways, make a difference in our country? I've been here for one year, so I speak as an outsider with an insider's view. There are things that I've seen which we need to change. There are things that I've seen that we need to call back from the beginning. We're having a conversation with the doctors there, and we're talking about how they would receive phone calls to pick up people from the airport. Now, I've had it also in Seattle. I've had it in the states that I serve, but now it's not there. You know, I have done a tour uh, of the states that I cover, and I go to the streets to look for Kenyans who are homeless and who are in drugs and everything, and it's crazy. I was in San Francisco, met this whole group, and I found Kenyans inside there. In, in, in LA, I found people inside there. So I know all the drug lines that are there, and there are Kenyans there. I would love to call Kenyans back to ourselves, and for us to think of this thing as a different way. And for you, all of you guys who are out there, I want to take my assurance. If there's anything that I say which makes sense to you, take this one that I'm 100% sure about the commitment the government is making towards changing the story of our country. You may not believe it, but trust me. You can take my word, write it down. After two years, we'll have the same, same conversation. And if things will not have changed, I will apologize to you. And th if things will have changed, welcome to the new Kenya. Because this is a different government. This is a truly different government. My performance contract doesn't say I should be hobnobbing with wine and ice and, and, and cheese. It says, how many diaspora visits have you made? How many people have you touched? How many, have you understood the people's problems or you're just bringing for us what, what stories the diaspora wants? Are you understanding the solutions that the diaspora wants to give or wants from the government? So we're here, we're ready to, to listen to everything that you have and I'm an a bit of an honest guy, I believe that if I don't know anything, I will tell you I don't know. The one I can make a phone call, I will make a phone call. The one I'll tell you, call me tomorrow for me to solve, I will call me tomorrow, I'll solve it. So let me go to the issues. The first major issue that the diaspora has is diaspora services. And for that, I would like to bring the greetings and the blessings of uh, Madame Rosalind Jogu, who is the PS, the Public Secretary for Diaspora Affairs, uh, who 100% knows that we're actually meeting right now, and I'm going to take back to her what the people of Houston are saying about specific things which they'd want articulated or changed. I also bring the greetings of my senior, uh, Ambassador Lazaro Samayo. We were with him yesterday night in a function, but he had to leave to go back to attend to matters at the uh, mission in, uh, in DC. And of course, I'm here with the blessings because it will end up on his desk very soon of His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Kenya. This for me is very important. He's my friend and it's important that I tell him, One of the things we spoke with the doctor is about how can we partner with areas that we come from to improve services. For example, he's plugging into medical. Now, when we had this issue with eCitizen last week, I was called by Kenyans in San Francisco in Silicon Valley, and they said, we have an association of Kenya's tech gurus in Silicon Valley. Can we be part of this solution? Because they're the best minds that are being used in Silicon Valley, which means they can also offer government solution. So I think the way forward for the diaspora is partnerships, and it's a diaspora bond a bond that will enable you as the diaspora to help the government do and build the services that you want in Kenya. We don't have to go to the Chinese to give us money. We don't have to come here. We can use your money and we pay it back to you. So we are working on various plans and platforms to look at these things. Of course, we have diaspora welfare. How can we be able to encourage Kenyans to get together and to work out on some things. Let me give you some statistics. The amount of capital we have out here is a lot. And to the older people, listen to me very well, because the research was done by a group of young people in Seattle, targeting your families. 
They said, the young people wrote a couple of things, a couple of issues, and to the parents who are interested, which I'll be sharing with you, like I said, we did these details. Number one, they spoke about the way the Kenyan parents work, and they had a problem with that. And they have listed a whole issue of that. Number two is about them belonging. And they're saying, okay, in the house, you want me to be Mluya, but when I step outside the, the door, I'm not a lawyer, I'm an American. So there's a clash of cultures, and they want you guys to address that. Number three, which was the most important to me, was they told me that, Ted, our parents never sit together to raise capital to support our ideas. But you guys get together to raise capital to transport bodies to Kenya. Let me give you a statistic. Do you know how many bodies we send to Kenya every year in America? You know how much money we need? We need between 1.6 million to 2 point? 2 point what? 2.5. All right? We send 400 bodies every year. And these young people are saying, how come we cannot be able to get together and find solutions for the things that we also want to do the same way you guys get together for these things that you guys want? Now, the research is pretty deep. It will take time, it, will be, then it needs to be backed up with more facts and everything. But these are voices from the third generation Kenyans who are here. And unfortunately, very soon. This country is for those young ones. If we don't plug them in, it will dry up. Because you want them to send to Ankoshi Maho, Uko in Ushago, it has no idea who Ankoshi Maho is. And they ask you questions. They'll ask you, why am I sending to him money? Doesn't he work? Mm. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> so unless we think differently, we'll have a problem. We also have a problem with the associations that we have built. Now, they have worked for the older people. But for the young people, it's not working. All right? I can tell you right now where there are more young people Kenyan than all of us here. Right now, I know where they are. So at what point do we get those guys to be part of the conversations? At what point do we get them to be part of the solutions? One of the ways that I'm trying to do is to encourage as many of the third generation Kenyans for us to get the parents to give them IDs, birth certificates, passports. So that your child who plays basketball here for college can come and play for the Kenya team. I'm the chairman of the Kenya Basketball Management Board. I know we need players. But when I get here, there are 500 kids playing amazing basketball. Why can't they play for Kenya? Why? Are they less of a Kenyan than our kids in Kenya? Why can't they play? Soccer. You know, strange games. You go to the Olympics. China lives there with 500 medals. Where did they get 500? Because they enter some of those strange games. They have a game called a synchronized dancing. Oh, there are 700 of them dancing there, so we get 700 medals. But why can't we also infiltrate those people? Now, what I'm telling you might be a broken record. You've had it. You tried it. It didn't work. But I told somebody today, I have nothing to lose by telling you. I will tell you guys. Me, God has blessed me. I'm a celebrity. Everybody knows who I am. Mukinishinda and Darudi Nyumbani. But the problem will remain in this place. But at some point, we must drain the swamp. As a Kenyan community, at some point, we must agree to drain the swamp. It will start with all of us. Let me finish by talking about passports and IDs. And I want to admit that, yes, we have had challenges. It is true. There is no lie about that. Government is looking for solutions, and one of the solutions which is going to happen, and I would like to change the conversation. Many of the people tell us, why can't you set up an embassy here in Houston? Why can't you do this? Why can't you do that? No problem. We can set up an embassy here, but what does it solve? It simply means it's a new station, fully staffed, fully kitted, and the budget must come from here. The solution might be this. I'm advised that solutions can only solve problems in the future. That is a solution. The solution is this. Government 
is looking to digitize the passport, the ID process 100%. Conversations are going on with different uh, providers. I just spoke to the doctors about it. Either the Postal Corporation or Rapid Scan, the people who do your health biometrics. If we can get a collaboration between the postal service, you can just walk into the post office, you do your fingerprints, you go on eCitizen, you fill your forms, you send them, you don't have to come to where we are, we don't have to come to where you are. That will do one thing, it will kill corruption. You don't have to pay me to process because the system has timed you. It will also kill the thing that you complain about, communication. Because once you get into the system, the system sends you a message. Like now, I, I know I'm flying out uh, tomorrow. I've already been sent a message to prepare to check in. So these are things which technology can fix. And my suggestion to you is just be a bit patient with us. We're changing the systems. The next time we have this conversation, it will be a different story. Now, it might be a story you've had and you've had and you've had. I want to give you a solution. Any of you with a problem with either passports, IDs, or any documentation, I am seated here. My number is in the public domain, 213-649-7964. Send me a message. I will send you an email address. Post it up there. And then we shall work on your case individually. And we are privileged to be here. It's my first time. I've been promising him that we come, and I'm glad we're here. So the issue that I want to ask is we have a big problem with uh, students getting denied visas, although some of them have full scholarship to come study here in the US. In the past, it used not to be a problem, but nowadays getting a visa is like cracking a rock. What can you guys do for, for these students that need to come over here? You cry, they are asking you, you have three days to come back to work. But what if we had people who would speak for us in those houses up there? If the house on the hill had a voice from Kenya, just like what other nationalities are doing. They have put in their people, that's why they are, they are being spoken about. In one of the states here, I know the amount of money that is being given as aid to that particular community. For businesses, for school fees, and for rent. But who is talking on our behalf? Because policy. But if we have these things streamlined in policy, I can assure you America is built on nothing else but policy. Even the integrity that we like about America is policy. The policeman knows if he takes a bribe, a pension emenda. There's no, there's no two stories about it. So once we have these things in policy, I think we shall have a better place. But let's listen to the expert, uh, our, our, our in-house tax expert. How are you? OK. Um, to come with my presentation, is uh, going to take three hours. OK. Um, on this issue of taxation, any, just like the United States, a Kenyan citizen is taxed on their global income. Okay? A US citizen is taxed on their global income. However, if you pay tax in a foreign country, you get a credit for that tax that you paid to make sure that that income is not taxed twice. Okay? So in the US, for example, you are an American citizen, you go work in Dubai, you make income in Dubai, you pay tax either in Dubai or let's say Kenya, okay? There is a certain amount of that income that is going to be exempt from taxes, which is $108,000. $108,000 will not be taxed, but you still have to report it on your taxes. Likewise, in Kenya, if you make income here and you don't make any income in Kenya, you file zero return in Kenya. So the issue that normally arises is the issue of resident versus non-resident. If you reside in Kenya and you make income in Kenya and in the U.S., obviously you're going to pay tax on combined income, but you get a credit for the taxes you paid in the United States or in 
any of the foreign countries. So there are treaties between Kenya and certain countries. We have about 21 countries, and the United States is not one of them. Why? Because he had just told us there is nobody fighting for us in Washington. Countries like Nigeria, South Africa, India, China, they have double taxation treaties with the United States. Kenya does not have, because we have nobody in Congress, in the Senate, to raise the issue. So it's left to the interpretation of the, the journalists, the individuals, and the bloggers. And Kenya Reve no, Kenya Revenue Authority has rules. And the rule simply says, any citizen who is, resides in Kenya, makes income in Kenya, has foreign income, but you are residing in Kenya, you still pay tax on all, you report all your income, but you get a credit for the taxes you pay, let's say, in the United States. Is that clear?